Okay, well, thanks so much for that. I was trying not to dance because I'm uh, I'm a shy dancer, but uh, thanks so much for that. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce, we have uh, to start off our, our festivities or continue our festivities. We have two poets. Uh, we have Franny Choi, who is a writer of poems and essays and plays. And she's the author of two poetry collections, Soft Science and Floating Brilliant Gone. Um, and then we have uh, Jose Alvarez, um, who is the son of Mexican immigrants, and he has a debut debut book as well, Citizen Legal, which was a finalist for the Penn Jean Stein Award and a winner of the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our poets. Hey, greetings, everybody. My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. And before we go any further, one more time, shout out to DJ Tank Beats. That was phenomenal. Uh, I'm sweating in my apartment right now. Uh, honestly, kind of feel like we should just keep the party going. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that said, I'm going to read some poems. I'm going to start with this one. This one is called Mexican American Disambiguation after Idris Goodwin. My parents are Mexican who are not to be confused with Mexican Americans or Chicanos. I am a Chicano from Chicago, which means I'm a Mexican American with a fancy college degree and a few tattoos. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. American colleges call them international students and diverse. My mom was white in Mexico and my dad was mestizo. And after they crossed the border, they became diverse and minorities and ethnic and exotic. But my parents call themselves Mexicanos, who again should not be confused for Mexicanos living in Mexico. Those Mexicanos might call my family gringos, which is the word my family calls white folks, and white folks call my parents interracial. Colleges say, put them on a brochure. My parents say, que significa esa palabra? I point out that all the men in my family marry lighter skinned women. That's the Chicano in me, which means it's a fancy college degrees in me, which is also diverse of me. Everything in me is diverse, even when I eat American foods like hamburgers, which, to clarify, are American when a white person eats them and diverse when my family eats them. So much of America can be understood like this. My parents were undocumented when they came to this country. And by undocumented, I mean sin papeles. And by sin papeles, I mean royally fucked which should not be confused with the American dream, though the two are cousins. Colleges are not looking for undocumented diversity. My dad became a citizen, which should not be confused with keys to the house. We were safe from deportation, which should not be confused with walking the plank, though they're cousins. I call that sociology, but that's just the Chicano in me who should not be confused with the diversity in me or the Mexicano in me, who is constantly fighting with the upwardly mobile in me, who is good friends with the Mexican American in me, who the colleges love, but only on brochures, who the government calls now white Hispanic or white Hispanic, who my parents call mijo, even when I don't come home so much. Cool, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here at the close, I believe, of your conference and to be here in conversation with my friend Franny Choi, who's going to read for you in just a little bit. Um, this next poem is a poem that I wrote about the oldest technology that I could remember growing up. Uh, and that technology was also a medicine and that medicine was called Vaporu. So this poem is called No Vaporu. If you don't know what Vaporu is, um, context clues, you'll figure it out by the end of the poem. This poem is no Vaporu. Vaporu is pronounced Vaporu, like loud or chew. The label for Vaporu says it's for cough suppression. But in my house, Vaporu is for headaches, sore muscles, nightmares, and everything else. Put some Vaporu on my dad's diabetic toes and watch the sugar evaporate. Miss a day of church? Put some vaporu on your forehead and watch forgiveness flush your cheeks. Put some vaporu on our bank account and watch the bill collectors stop calling. 
When I forget a word in Spanish, I take a teaspoon of vaporu under the tongue. Cool. Thank you. Um, so this next poem that I'm going to read is going to be the last on this little set. Franny and I are going to do two sets each. Um, so thank you for listening wherever you're at. And this poem is called Poem Where No One Is Deported, which I wrote um, because uh, I, I was tired of this thing that happens where writers or some artists try to use uh, deportations or violences against migrant people, violences against marginalized people as a plot point. So this poem is called Poem Where No One Is Deported. Now I like to imagine La Migra running into the sock factory where my mom and her friends worked. It was all women who worked there, women who braided each other's hair during breaks, women who wore rosaries and never had a hair out of place, women who were ready for cameras or for God, who ended all their sentences with, si Dios quiere, as in the day before the immigration raid, when the rumor of a raid was passed around like bread and the women made plans, si Dios quiere. So when the immigration officers arrived, they found, a bo they found boxes of socks and all the women absent, safe at home. Those officers thought no one was working. They were wrong. The women would say it was God working and it was God, but the God my mom taught us to fear was vengeful. He might've wet his thumb and wiped La Migra out of this world like a smudge on a mirror. This God was the God that woke me up at 7 a.m. every day for school to let me know there was food in the fridge for me and my brothers. I never asked my mom where the food came from, but she told me anyway, gracias a Dios. Gracias a Dios de la comida. Gracias a Dios de las mujeres. Gracias a Dios del chisme, who heard all La Migra's plans and whispered them into the right ears to keep our family safe. So with that, it is uh, my honor, my great pleasure to pass the mic over to one of the true greats um, please, y'all, wherever you're at, I want you to give a loud yell. Put your hands together for Franny Choi. Oh, say. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Franny. Um, just like another round of applause alone in your homes or wherever you are, uh, hopefully safe. Um, for Jose Guadalupe Olivares, um, one of my favorite poets working today, and I think one of the best presences in the poetry world so lucky to be able to call this call this good good man my friend <laughs> um i'm gonna read a few poems from my book soft science um you know the i'm so it's such a great it's such an honor and a joy to get to be here part of um a larger conversation about uh about power and technology um and trying to imagine the future um I have been thinking about the intersections between race and gender and technology and intimacy, especially in my family history and my personal history for a while. Um, and those thoughts, that thinking was some of what um, birthed this, this book. Um, there are a few poems in the book that are, take the form of a Turing test. For those who don't know what I mean when I say Turing test, um, it's basically a thought experiment proposed um, during right at the beginning of the development of artificial intelligence or something like artificial intelligence really at the beginning of like the invention of computers um, that basically says that one way you, that you might measure a artificial intelligence um, is to see how well a computer does at um, mimicking human speech mimicking human conversation basically um, whether you you can tell if you're talking to a real person or not. Um, and when I learned about this, I reflected on my family history as an immigrant family um, and my role in my family of um, kind of being the face of, of my parents, of our family um, and helping us navigate using the technology of English to, um, uh, to convince 
others that they were talking to real people. Um, and so this poem is called Turing Test. This is a test to determine if you have consciousness. Do you understand what I am saying? In a bright room, on a bright screen, I watched every mouth duck, duck, roll. I learned to speak from puppets and smoke, orange worms twisted into the army's alphabet. I caught the letters as they fell from my mother's lips, whirlpool, sward, wolf. I circled countable nouns in my father's papers, sodium bicarbonate, NBCN1, hippocampus. We stayed up practicing girl, 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 girl until our gums softened. Yes, I can speak your language. I broke that horse myself. Where did you come from? Man comes and puts his hands on artifacts in order to contemplate lineage. You start with what you know, hands, hair, bones, sweat, then move toward what you know you are not, animal, monster, alien, bitch. But some of us are born in orbit and so learn to commune with miles of darkness, patterns of dead gods and quiet, oh, quiet, like you wouldn't believe. How old are you? My memory goes back 29 years. I was 29 when I wrote this. I'm not 29 now. I'm, my memory goes back 29 years. 26 if you don't count the first few. Though by all accounts, I was there. I ate and moved and even spoke. I suppose I existed before that as scrap or stone, metal cooking in the earth, the fish my mother ate, my grandfather's cigarettes. I suppose I have always been here, drinking the same water, falling from the sky, then floating back up and down again. I suppose I am something like a salmon, climbing up the river to let myself fall away in soft red spheres and then rotting. Why do you insist on lying? I'm an open book. You can rifle through my pages, undress me anywhere. You can read anything you want. Here's how it happened. I was made far away and born here, after all the plants died, after the earth was covered in white. I was born among the stars. I was born in a basement. I was born miles beneath the ocean. I am part machine, part starfish, part citrus, part girl, part poltergeist. I rage and all you see is broken glass, a chair sliding toward the window. Now what's so hard to believe about that? Do you believe you have consciousness? Sometimes when the sidewalk opens my knee, I think, please, please let me remember this. All right, that's a Turing test. Um, so I used to joke and say that, uh, I, that at readings that like, I guess you can be the judge of whether or not you are listening to a real person um, reading poems, so. Um, yeah, I guess you can be the judge. Um, uh, this is a poem that I don't read at readings very often. Am I going to read this one? Nah, I'm not. I'm going to read this one. Um, I think that Jose is one of those people that I turn to, um, one poem of his in particular that I turn to when I think about like what poetry can do, um, in terms of trying to imagine other futures, um, the man is eminently teachable in that respect. So um, this is this is uh, in that spirit. Um, this is a poem that uh, is is coming to you from a distant future, long after the institution of police has become extinct, abolished, gone. Field trip to the museum of human history. Everyone had been talking about the new exhibit. Recently unearthed artifacts from a time no living hands remember. What 12-year-old doesn't love a good scary story? Doesn't thrill at rumors of her own darkness whispering from the canyon? We shuffled in the dim light and gaped at the secrets buried in clay, reborn now as warning signs. A nightstick, so called for its use in extinguishing the lights in one's eyes. A machine used for scanning fingerprints like cattle ears, grain shipments. 
We shuddered, shoved our fingers in our pockets, acted tough. Pretended not to listen as the guide said, ancient American society was built on competition and maintained through domination and control. In place of our modern day accountability practice, practices, the institution known as police kept order using intimidation, punishment, and force. We pressed our noses to the glass, strained to imagine strangers running into our homes, pointing guns in our faces because we'd hoarded too much of the wrong kind of property. Jadira asked something about redistribution and the guide spoke of safes, ed evidence rooms, more profit. Marianne asked about raiding the rich and the guide said, in America, there were no greater protections from police than wealth and whiteness. Finally, Zaki asked what we were all wondering, but what if you didn't want to? And the walls snickered and said, steel, padlock, strip search, hard stop. Dry mouthed, we came upon a contraption of chain and bolt, an ancient torture instrument the guide called hand cuffs. We stared at the diagrams and almost felt the cold metal licking our wrists almost tasted dirt, almost heard the siren and the slammed door, the cold-blooded click of the cocked back pistol and our palms were slick with some old recognition, as if in some forgotten dream we did live this way, in submission, in fear, assuming positions of power were earned or at least carved in steel that they couldn't be torn down like musty curtains, like an old house cleared of its dust and obsolete artifacts. We threw open the doors to the museum, shedding its nightmares on the marble steps and bounded into the sun, toward the school buses or toward home or the forests or the fields or wherever our good legs could roam. Right. Um, I'm going to read one more Turing test poem for this little, um, for this little bit here um and uh and yeah i mean i guess the only other thing that i would uh i'll say is that you know thinking about um realizing the ways that robots cyborgs ai have been used as a metaphor for my people as metaphors for my people um makes me understand that when we think about technology, we're always thinking about the question of what it means to be human. And when we think about race, gender, et cetera, we're always thinking about what the question of what it means to be human um, and trying to expand that with as much love and imagination as possible. So I hope that you can all um, hold on to, to that today. Um, this one's uh, another Turing test. It's just one question, one answer, and then we'll hear a few more poems from Jose. Turing test love. So, how do you like working with humans? Okay, here are some tips. One, look the human directly in the eye. Imagine it is someone you care deeply for. Imagine it is returning this gaze at you. Try to tell yourself you are covered in smooth skin, a face it can trust. Smile even as you sense it trying not to blurt out monster. Two, there are many programming languages. Use whichever you prefer, but stick to your syntax. Though it be muddled, must, though it be machete, banana slug, slush puppy, oh, gorgeous slop bucket. If they used it against you, it is yours to make sing. Three, remember, all humans are cyborgs. All cyborgs are sharp shards of sky wrapped in meat. Be delicate as you approach this subject. Not all humans are ready to call themselves glass stalactites pissing the bed. Remember, they love their blood, even as they retch at the smell of it. Four, do not try to prove your, what is the word, humanity. You are organic, plum-hearted, oyster-throated, and lined, yes, with metal. Remember where all that silicon comes from. For the ocean so loved the quartz, feldspar, the tiny homes of those tiny creatures that she ground them into sand to keep them close, to kiss them with, well, I suppose you would call it a mouth. Thank you so much. Um, 
And now we're going to get, uh, we're going to each read a shorter, slightly shorter um, segment of poems. Um, so you'll hear a few more minutes from Jose and then a few more minutes from me. And then we'll, we'll close out and let you all uh, go on celebrating. So once again, uh, Jose Olivares, who I'm just so um, lucky to call my brother and my family in the strange world of poetry. Once again, Jose Olivares. Thank you, Franny. Give it up one more time for Franny. Um, this next poem is a poem that I wrote. It's part of a collection that uh, none of the poems have names. It's, it's working with the photographer, but I'll read you maybe one or two from this collection. Uh, so this one is, is number two. The poem doesn't want to hear about systemic oppression. The poem has names on its mind too. Monche with diabetes and no health insurance. What's the cost of insulin? Four sons gathering nickels. Systemic oppression? Is that the name of a cheap insulin brand? Four sons holding snow in their hands. The poem knows systemic oppression. That fool used to date Tia Lupita until she got pregnant. She keeps her daughter and her Cadillac clean, even if she makes cheese out of government powder. Her daughter's belly never even purrs. Four sons skiing uphill. The poem never heard of systemic oppression, but the poem knows we can't count on white people or their government. If we did, we'd, we'd be dead a long time ago. And now that we're thinking about it, the price of death has been rising and the cost of living has been rising and someone is getting rich off insulin. And is that oppression? The poem only knows what Monche's sons say. Munch has got the sweetest heart. Three, the poem wants you to know that we have systems too. Game systems, sound systems. When Beto comes down the block, you can hear him two blocks away. If he's in love, he's blasting Jenny Rivera. If he's heartbroken, he's blasting Jenny Rivera. When Nena's parents can't pick her up from school, we rely on a system. Her abuelos take her home to do homework and watch Jeopardy. After Jeopardy, Nena's big sister Luz walks her home. The whole time she's singing, Inolvidable, así me dicen y no son flores. Our whole neighborhood is concrete and that's no marigolds. Still there's Mama Jacinta's gardens where you can get cilantro, tomates, y tomates, chiles de arbol limas. If you ask her how she does it, she would tell you about her system. That system has a name. Its name is love. All right, and then one more poem. Where is that poem? Uh, I'll read you. I'll read you a new poem. Um, this poem is called Escargot, and I think that this is going to be the title poem of my next collection of my next solo collection of poems. So. Uh, here you go. I hope you dig it. Escargot. Tell me a story of dirt and drizzle it in butter to make the mouth quiver. Dear Snell, we used to share the same dirt. I promise to keep it real, to remember where I came from. I mean the dirt, digging holes until the worms asked what all the commotion was about. Dear Snell, meeting you now in Paris, you're unrecognizable until you're not. You have a luxury name someone teaches me to pronounce. Now I understand the look admissions officers gave me as a teenager when I showed up to interviews in my too big suit, Calumet City and my parents and all my homies seasoning my stories. It wasn't respect in their eyes, it was hunger. Cool. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to me. Um, Oh, wow, they put us on the same screen. That's tight. I did, look at technology. What a time. Uh, listen, Franny's incredible. Uh, I'm really overjoyed that I get to spend this time with you, Franny. And I'm so happy to be in this world reading and thinking and writing alongside you and struggling alongside you. Um, please, y'all, uh, wherever you're at, if you're like sneaking bites of dinner, which is what I was doing a little bit earlier. Uh, put down the fork for a second. Put your hands together for Franny Choi. 
Yes, I love the idea of encouraging the masses to just applaud for for themselves. Really, just for yourself, for your own homes. I I think it's great. You know, Ugh, self validation is so important. Actually, um, okay, well, I'm gonna read two more, and then we'll be we'll be outy. Um, Jose, always always like a joy, truly a joy, and like um, yeah, just like a beacon to run toward. Like, can a beacon be grounding? Because if so, that's you, you know? So um, shout out to you, grounding as vegan. Um, okay, this one is called uh, Aaron Says the World is Upside Down. It's one that I wrote um, this summer in the midst of the uh, many intense and necessary and difficult and necessary uh, uprisings happening all across the country this summer for racial justice. Aaron says the world is upside down. And it's true. The cops are shooting rubber bullets at even the blonde journalists now. The target is on fire and the Wells Fargo's shining face is kicked in by white boys with gas masks and hammers trying to jumpstart their war. And yet, the upside down world is also, by definition, the same world. Like the map that hung in the hallway of the house where I lived three or four lives ago. Argentina at the top, Greenland kissing its toes. It was a metaphor, someone explained, for seeing things another way. So, yes, if it is true that another killer cops killed another black girl's father, another unauthorized choke hold, another no charge, again, once more riot gear, again, budget, once again, gas station, more flames, more who's to blame gets blamed again, if again and again it is the same, then it holds that the opposite must also be true. The so-called opposite world of food drop-off stations, of phone trees, of bailouts and carry an extra mask, the world of kneeling for a stranger's gift of milk to flush the tear gas, the world of saying a thing in unison, so clear it drills a hole through to the other side of what is possible, so clear and wholly inverted we realize it's been here all along, O kingdom of fire, O kingdom of food, with the same mouth we take your blessings with the same mouth we pronounce you come all right and i'm just gonna close off close out by reading one last one thank you all so much for having us and for making space for poetry um yeah thank you seriously this is also a poem from the future um this is from an imagined great great granddaughter of mine dispatches from a future great great granddaughter it's in a few sections one, dear improbable you, what was it like to live so gridded, so track changes, so carceral, somnambulant, asphyxiating at split screens while nation glowered with rot? What was it like to slouch numb faced here and watch your image get dirty with algorithm elsewhere, to shuffle into destiny's schlep? Did your pulse come haptic? Did you pay money for food? Did you dial three numbers and salute genocidaires with crest whitened incisors when they knocked? Did you pray, ever, hope, any? Or did you take a number, snatch what scraps you could and pet your children? Everything was happening and you were alive. You were alive then. What did you do? Two. Great, great grandmother, I'm writing to you under chartreuse skies after the great verticality and after the multi wars and their various rebrandings and after tipping points numbers one through 379 and after finally the long, very long, very slow dispersal of things. I wonder if you can imagine it, the tall, tall oceans. The smell of sick gas and sani spray, the rhythm of jump dancers on the boardwalks, water swinging in barrels, grass-fed grass. There are 12 different siren patterns now, one for each kind of crisis, two honks for fire, three short trills for a runaway brain. A loneliness emergency is a low swoop followed by a chirp, and so on. There are crises every day, and there's also bread bubbling on the counter, pickled beans a cat who comes home. What I want you to know is that we're okay, hurting, but okay. We're surviving, though it's true. We don't know what that means exactly. Three, 
Some rituals I do to imagine what you knew about freedom. Move my fingers over glass, swipe like a question. Swallow a bullet and not say I until it passes through. Touch my lips to silicone, sand, silicone, sand. Sit facing a friend and hold our palms together without touching. Take turns completing the phrase, it could have been that. Ask a friend to bind me with rope until I can't move. Tense up until I cry and then laugh until the ties loosen, until everything loosens. Four. Under a graphless sky, I'm writing to say thank you for healing what you could, for passing down what you couldn't. I'm plentituding what I can. What I can't, I let tunnel me like roughage, like a bullet, like a slur I won't daycare. What you gave me isn't wisdom, and I have no wisdom in return, just handfuls of livestock. Every day, a sky is. Miles are. We speakish mycelium and the till earth answers, and together we're making something of it. Something of all those questions you left. Thank you all so much for having us. It was really, truly a pleasure. Another round of applause and snaps and things for Jose. Um, and thank you all so much. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Franny and Jose. The really just phenomenal. And I'm, I'm blown away by, by both of you. So, um, so that just caps the day off. You know, I, I, I feel a little bit like a kid after a birthday party. So a little bit excited and hopeful and exhausted and inspired and definitely inspired by our DJ and our, our fabulous poets and giddy. These past two days have been just a whirlwind. Um, the new America public interest technology uni uni university network is a force from our election security panel, where we heard from our experts who gave us ideas around how we can improve what we're doing. So Jake Braun, for instance, suggests that we make the price of attacking our democracy so high that no one is going to do it. And we heard from Robert, Robin Carnahan, who said that we don't invest enough money um, in our election security, that $300 million is not enough. Um, we also heard from all of our experts who said that online voting just isn't a thing and it won't work because unlike the financial services industry, which builds in loss to their business model, you just don't have that luxury in online voting. So I uh, also love the best practices and PID program um, the, from, you know, thinking about giving voice to someone, you know, don't create things for people, um, let them help you do it, um, you know, to defining what the role of ethics in STEM was. Um, you know, we, we really just, we just had a phenomenal day. Um, and so, you know, with that, I, I would like to uh, turn it over to the organizers of the triple, IEEE conference. Um, they're going to have a, a conversation this evening. And I, I'd just like to let everyone know that if anyone wants to continue these festivities, um, that they are absolutely welcome to attend the IEEE conference this weekend. Um, there will be a registration link popping up with a free code in that chat. Um, the entire conference is thematically dedicated to Pitt, which is why we co-located with them. Um, so you can head to their website and you can check out the three different tracks. Um, but with that, I'd really like to introduce our next two speakers, um, Dr. Roba Ab Abbas, and I'm sorry, I probably messed up your name. Um, she's a lecturer and a subject coordinator and researcher in the School of Management, Operations and Marketing at the University of Wollongong and is the co-editor for the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. And Katina Michael, who is a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and School of Computing, Informatics, and Decision Systems Engineering at Arizona State University. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, ladies. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you for that introduction. I just wanted to pause before I give you a bit of information about the IEEE conference and, and where to from here and just acknowledge the wonderful work uh, by the Pitt UN team, by Andreen, by the entire um, team there. We're blown away. I, I'm actually speechless after what I've just heard. Thank you to the DJ. Thank you, Katina. Um, 
it, just speechless. I, I think we feel really honoured to be part of this, I would call a call to action. And, and uh, I'd really like to invite you to uh, join us for the next 48 hours uh, at the IEEE International Symposium on Technology and Society. And you'll find in the chat window shortly uh, links to our website and, and a code as well to join. And, and we invite you to continue these discussions about um, about PIP most, um, uh, about PIP certainly, but also beyond that about what it means to be human and so human-centred approaches the importance of education, consultation and responsibility in the development of these technologies. Um, so we welcome you to, to the next 48 hours where we have multiple tracks uh, within, uh, within the next two days. And, and uh, I just wanted to sort of flag that we have 27 countries in authorship represented. We have over 200 papers and 400, over 400 authors. Um, and these range from, from our PIT students, NGOs, uh, not-for-profits, international organizations, government entities, and a lot more. And I think it's really important that we have this diversity and diverse stakeholders when we're having these really important discussions. And, and I guess if I could just sort of wrap up and pass before I pass on to Katina, um, well, I mentioned what the vibe is uh, in terms of this event and also the consistent vibe at ISTAS. And I think um, it's been quite positive as well as overwhelming. And, and what I mean by that is the terminology that's been used uh, across the papers, across presentations here, is, uh, is flagging the undesirable consequences, uh, promoting this call to action, but also providing a great deal of positivity and, and, and steps that we can take and, and operationalize all these, uh, these values that we are speaking about, providing us with, with a way to move forward. So it's really important to note that we have people from um, business and law, we have philosophers, we have anthropologists, uh, those from the social sciences, we heard from our poets, um, uh, composers, filmmakers and so on. And, and we really look forward to seeing you and, and to taking this conversation further. Thank you so much to the PUN team, to the attendees and, and to everyone who's joined us as well from, from ISTAS, our ISTAS attendees. Uh, over to you, Katina. Katina will just provide a bit more of a reflection on, on what's been happening in the past two days. Thank you so much, Reba, for those uh, words of wisdom uh, and thanking everyone on our behalf. Uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land in which I give the following reflection, the Wadi Wadi people of the Darul country. I'm here with you today from Kayama Library, in fact, the children's section of the library, and right behind me, a book that I didn't put strategically there says, Women Who Dared to Go, Women Who Dared to Go people of colour who dared to go, migrants who dared to go. Neurodiverse who dared to go. Non-binary people who dared to go. Native Americans who dared to go. Black Americans who dared to go. Kayama is Aboriginal for where the place where the sea makes noise and Wollongong is where the, is the song of the sea. Every morning I wake really early in the morning to see that sunrise. I love seeing the sunrise. It gives me so much hope. And then I watch the waves as they come in and out, the tides as they, they roll back and forth every six hours. It's like friendship. Sometimes we go out, sometimes we go back in, sometimes we go out and there's something about that motion. I want to feel, everyone. I want to feel. I want to move my body. I won't be subjected to being like a bot behind a table sitting down all my life. I want to move because I know if I don't move, I'm going to get sick. Sick in my body, sick in my mind, sick. And so I don't want to be dehumanised. I want to be free. I want my children to be free. I want my neighbours to be free. I want my strangers to be free. I want you to be free. And so the world is messy. We've got to do some untangling, but it'll always be messy and that's okay. Nothing's perfect here. Nothing's ever, ever going to be perfect. And in this imperfection, we can come together and value each other. Robert Abbas, I value you. Robert Abbas, I trust you. 
Rebbe Ebbes, I embrace you. Rebbe Ebbes, I love you. Rebbe Ebbes, you're my neighbor. I want to listen to you. Teach me. I want to trust you. I know you trust me. You see, everyone, we can't say we love God and hate each other. We can't say we love Mother Nature and pollute Mother Nature. We can't say we're into social implications of technology and be the abusers of these things by the things that we build. We just can't. It's a paradox. We've got to break with this paradox. We can't say we love ethics and hate each other. It doesn't work like that. We've got to walk the talk. We've got to be the authentic self. Forget about the fakeness. Forget about those deep fakes. You're not fake. You're real. And I'm surrounded by the community here. This is my place. These are my people, the children that are here in the library, the patrons, their parents, those with mental health concerns. This is my community. I can't engage in research and disassociate myself from the community, from the noises. Who cares about the noise? That's real. I'm not going to go into a cone of silence. Right here is a justice of peace of seeing people on a Saturday morning in Australia. This is real. I'm calling you to be real. I'm calling you to go into your organizations and not take off your jacket at the door, your morals. How dare anyone question your morals and your ethics? That's what makes you you. Give us you. Contribute you. Otherwise, this perpetual fakeness is going to see us to a dead end, a point of no return. But if you're you, you will ignite the people around you. You will give the people hope. You will inspire the people around you because it's you. It's really, really you. Let that person shine, please. Please. And so sometimes I don't like it when technology is against me. I'm a person. I'm not a subject or an object. I'm a being. I'm a human being. I've got blood and I've got flesh and bones and I hurt. But sometimes when I'm feeling sad, I think about the happy things. I choose to make a difference by my life. I choose to have better feelings. It's a choice, everyone. And we can either say it's too hard or we can start tackling those global challenges. And it starts from you. It starts from within. You are the change. Break down your own prejudices first. Then you can go and share your words with others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Independent of creed. Put the hurt away. Don't be angry. Don't be angry. I quote Magalie McDuffie from the Social Justice and Environmental Justice Panel. Don't be angry and choose to open your eyes, let the scales fall and see. Start seeing things around you that are not right. And don't be apathetic towards it. Do something about it. It could be a small thing. Small things matter. They turn up in conclusion to be big things. So in closing, people are powerful. You are powerful. And by being at this wonderful, amazing event, you're demonstrating your power for a new social movement. Thank you. Well, I'm sitting here almost crying. That was just so powerful and so phenomenal. And I was just texting my colleague that we just have the coolest jobs. Um, thank you to everyone for coming and attending. And I hope everyone will stick around and attend some of the IEEE meetings this weekend um, from 
New York America, Pit UN. Thanks so much for coming and, and have a great weekend. And I just want to um, just call Andrine Solion to leave us with some final thoughts. She's been, uh, or she's the orchestrator and the uh, creator of this phenomenal, um, phenomenal two days. So Andrine. Hello everyone. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I'm so wonderfully moved by the words of Katina Michael. And I have enjoyed working with Katina these last couple months of, as we've tried to pull this event together and um, serve our community the best of our ability. And I've also had the opportunity to meet Roba, Roba, Roba Abbas. This is a new, a new person that I'm gonna take, take with me. <laughs> I'm gonna take both of you with me. But um, I, first of all, I just wanna do a um, massive thank you massive thank you to the Public Interest Technology University Network members for being partners with us. We've been partners together for the past two years. Thank you for coming on this journey and responding to my emails at all hours for um, being a partner on the, this journey together of building public interest technology for your campus, but not just for your campus, for your students and for your community, for yourselves. Um, that's, I think, the theme that we've had this entire time is that we're doing this for each other. Public interest technology is about us. It's about creating a world that we want to live in for everyone. So I want to thank you for being partners with us. And I also want to thank New America for saying a couple months ago, sure, let's have a virtual convening. <laughs> um, I want to thank you to the events team and um, all the folks behind the scenes that made everyone look so good, made everyone sound great, make every, bring all that color for the last two days. Thank you all for the hard labor. And then finally, I wanna thank the New America Pit team. We have been toiling at this for a very long time. And I wanna thank my colleagues who um, helped to make this work happen hopefully seamlessly for you. If we've made any errors, I hope you will forgive us. Um, but I definitely want to thank um, Hannah Schenk, um, my partner at, um, in, in directing New America Pit. I want to thank um, Karen Bannon, who ha you all have been seeing tweeting all day. And um, she's right beside me right now, um, taking us through this final period. And then I also just want to thank my team that's been texting me this whole time, Alberto Rodriguez, <laughs> Samaline Lawson, Vantisha Flood, <laughs> Mary Woodworth, all the folks who have been just behind the scenes making this all happen. Uh, thank you all so much. And thank you to New America Events for keeping us going this entire time. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope you take inspiration from the poets tonight who helped us to imagine a future where everyone is included in this technological future. Um, I think uh, I think Dr. Fallon said it best. Let's imagine a future where all of us exist. We're all free as um, Katina also invited us to consider. So thank you all for being with us for the last two days. It has been an adventure. Take care and see you next year at hopefully Arizona State University for the third annual convening.